right, hello Fortinas, brothers and sisters, welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is June 14th, 2021, a little over a month to go. I pray everybody's excited, they're watching, they're praying, they're seeking the Lord, they're sharing with people, they're praying for people, they're lifting each other up. Because man, it's exciting. <laughs> I don't know what more to say, except it's exciting. Uh, okay, maybe I got a few more things to say. <laughs> it, it's we're we're gonna go through some things here today, guys, that are just gonna be so awesome that that <laughs> when we look at them, we say, "Of course, of course." All right, so there's gonna be a couple things like that today where we're gonna say, "Of course," when we talk about the whole Galilean wedding, right? We've talked about that before, the whole 13, 14 year thing. We'll save that towards the very end. We're going we're gonna to get into, um, uh, 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 um, what do they call it? A controversy or, or people and scholars and, and biblical uh, uh, um, uh, seminaries and the whole nine yards. They'll call what we're going to get into, they call it uh, uh, discrepancies or you can't take these things literally. We're, you're going to see something pretty awesome. And this one is going to relate to um, Judas, all right? We've shared a little bit about it. I told you that I would uh, talk about it in, in an upcoming video. We're going to share Judas, and we're going to be able to show that timing with Judas, all because we have the revelation of the open Gospels, who they're speaking to, and then the 14 years. Those are the two keys to, under to understanding the end of days. But not only understanding the end of days, as I've said many times lately, but also to understanding discrepancies or or what people considered contradictions or something. Like I said, I'm going to show you something even from C.S. Lewis, the famous C.S. Lewis, which most everybody knows uh, or has heard about. These theologians have dreamt, guys, I promise you, they had dreamt and prayed of understanding what's been revealed to us here. This this revelation of the gospels, okay? They 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 they've been trying to do a harmony within the gospels for centuries, and the Lord has blessed us with it over these past three and a half years. You're going to see more of that when we do this today, when we get to that point uh, with Judas. All right, just undeniable stuff, and you'll see how Judas can have two types going on where one, he's splattered and his guts are everywhere, and yet another one where he hangs himself, okay? So we're going to talk on that today. I'm going to touch a little bit on, um, uh, as we get started, I'm, I'm going to make it a little bit more clear or or help people understand that maybe hadn't quite seen it yet um, with how is it that the Feast of Weeks being 7 times 7 plus 50 days, we'll show it in the calendar count, which is easy uh, and crystal clear, but I'm going to show you how it was possible again with the Gospels, just on just a, a quick little touch on it, because I know some people had uh, questions on on how to how that was seen in the uh, end of each Gospel of the Synoptic Gospels, and then of course, for everybody that uh, that's newer, you know we've had a, a bit of a bump in the subscribers because of this video right here, uh, our sister in Christ Pearl uh, Carol. Kaleri, I believe it is, uh, did a video. It was shared with me here earlier today. And I went through and I listened to it. And man, <laughs> you know, we don't have time to watch everybody. And I don't watch most people. I just, I, I'm studying is what I'm doing, right? So you guys are the ones that share things with me. And I check them out here and there. And what was interesting was before I did this video, I knew that Pearl was one of those people that over three, four years ago, had received this 717. And so before I did this video, I went and commented on her last video telling her, hey, you need to watch the next video that's going to be published by Ministry Revealed because you're going to get your revelation. You are going to see and understand this 717 that you received because it's this year. All right. And so she came, she watched it, and she's done a video. And many of her people have come to, uh, uh, or I should say a number of her people have subscribed and are coming to watch now as well. Well, some of the things that she had in the past, which I hadn't heard of in relation to Lamentations, it's awesome. We're going to show 
uh, a few minutes, two, three minute clip of one of her videos and, uh, of this last video she did. And then you're going to see something within it that as soon as she showed it, I caught it right away. And it's in Genesis 1, 1 to Genesis 1, verse 2. All right. It's going to be a confirmation to what we were talking about, I think, in the last video or the second last video when we talked about uh, the Hebrew calendar and 21 uh, 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 letters in the Hebrew or sorry, not Hebrew calendar, Hebrew alphabet, 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. And we know the end is seven, 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 seven easy, then seven seals, then seven trumpets. Right. And we talked about how it was an image of the twenty one thousand. And then the you can say that the Jubilee, the eternity is the twenty second year or the twenty seven thousand, uh, the twenty second thousandth year. All right. That is eternity. And some people are saying, well, well, how did you see that? Well, I'll go into that a little bit more today just to, to touch on it in particular when she talks about it. I'm going to show you uh, what it was that caught my attention. All right. So, first of all, for those who uh, were wanting this and were asking about it, I want to let you guys know uh, they're all updated. They're not updated on the website yet, but you will find it in the description box under each video. Let me just click on this video so you guys can see. Go to the description box right here, and you will find all the links. Okay, thank you guys. For those that... Uh, that stepped up and supported again i i'm very grateful thank you so much um you can uh, of course go to amazon buy the book buy the ebook or paperback you can download the pdf for free from the website um but this is what i wanted to show you guys so the 14 year timeline chart is now updated the open books chapters to years there there wasn't an update nothing had to move it's just a change in uh, in the words from spring to fall uh, Israel is the timepiece. Again, it was just the changing of spring to fall in the wording. All right. So these things are now all changed and you could find them in the description box under the videos. All right. So I wanted to share that with you. In fact, I'll show them to you just so you can see. Here's one. It's not usually in the description box. If anybody wants it, they could always email me. The email is in the description box under the videos. This is what we call the, the story, uh, uh, the whole story of the end times, all right? It's a 22-year story, just like the, the 22 chapters of, the, uh, of Revelation, the 22 characters in the Hebrew alphabet. The, the revelation of it all is 7771, okay? We shared about this recently, um, that revelation of Pi, okay, that the menorah, the seven branch menorah, and it, it's seven uh, uh, um, olive uh, 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 almond buds, seven olive buds, almond buds, seven almond buds, and then boom, one in the middle at the top. Okay, it's seven, 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 and one, and then they're on what? At the top of each one, there are seven, and there are seven candles. What it is, it's twenty two total divided by seven is your base foundation for pi. All right, guys, it is built into everything. And this is one of the reasons that I believe the the total is 21, 22 years or 22,000 as well. Okay, so we'll touch on that a little bit when we get to it. But all I've done here was change where it said fall. I turned to uh, uh, where it said spring. I changed to fall where it said spring. I changed to fall. Now, here's the thing. You'll notice <coughs> fall feasts of 2021. Okay, and that's because trumpets doesn't always land in the fall okay just like this year in 2021 it's not going to land in the fall it's still going to be late summer okay all the fall feasts this year are going to fall in summer okay oh just about sukkot will be uh will be the the beginning of of fall okay but trumpets and yom kippur they're still going to be in summer okay so that's why I made a, a point of, of wording it the way I did. And so here you have, all we did was change it to fall, fall 21, 22. Okay, so it's all it's still all here. All the years are the same. It's just gone from fall to spring. Uh, sorry, from spring to fall, sorry. Okay. So you can find this. You can pause this. You can read this right here if you want. And here's the other one. Israel is the timepiece. 
Okay, this is something we've known for a long time as well. We've broken it all down from Psalms 90 and 10. That's what this is all about. And 2021, Feast of Trumpets, typically or typically around fall. Okay, that's why you'll see fall everywhere else. It's really that time of trumpets. You'll see this confirmation uh, of trumpets when we get to the end of today's video. Okay, you will see and you will understand from Matthew and the purpose of the wedding time that the whole thing had to begin at trumpets. That's one of those things you're going to say, oh, there it was the whole time. Okay. Here's the other piece. I know people had asked about this. This is the tribulation timeline, we call it. There's a little wording down below that I've always had. I updated that for you guys as well. And you could see here, okay, the escape of the bride, summer 2021. Son of Man, the 40 days of the Son of Man, still summer of 2021. And the wording's all down here. The escape of the Bride of Christ, spring of 2028, not the fall of 27. All of these things, everything is still in its place. It just moved like, see, when the Lord returns, instead of spring of 2034, it's fall of 34. You guys will see it, especially when you find out, as you guys all know, when the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives here, he hasn't returned. Um, at the end of 14 years. He's returned at the end of 13 years, okay? The end of the story is fall 2035. So he didn't come at here at the end of 14. This is 13. And as you all know, the story is six, seventh year Sabbath, right? Sabbath year, and then sixth and seventh year Sabbath. In this seventh year Sabbath, though, is the final battle. He destroys and you can say cleans up, whoops them, right? does everything he does, and then it's over at the end of 14 years. And you'll notice, so if it's fall of 34, when it's over, it'll be the fall of 35, 2035, okay? And you're going to see that it always had to be, all right? Amazing stuff. And then in the chapters to years, thank you for uh, our, uh, our brother that, that updated this for me. Nothing, again, when I say updated, I don't mean everything was all changed around. I mean, all we did was change spring to fall. That's it, okay? And I say fall feasts because, again, in not all cases do the feasts fall in the fall. All right, so that's all that's happened. So with that being said, let's start. Oh, let's start where I usually start because there are new people, especially now. This right here, brothers and sisters, anybody that's new, it's called the Revealed End Times Study Note Series. This is the video or the series anybody new must come and listen to first. Now, I know you don't have to listen to every single one, but you must listen to the first and second 30-minute videos. In the description box, you will find this printout that I read from. You can print it out. You can make notes on it. Or you can just read along and, and not download it, all right? Up to you. But it's 30 minutes and 30 minutes. This intro video, these two intros, will reveal to you who the Gospels are speaking to. That is the number one key the Lord revealed to me in uh, September of 2017, when everything in my life changed on September 8th. That was the beginning of the revelation. You will see... These what people have thought as discrepancies or maybe we shouldn't take the word, you know, all literal because there's these discrepancies. They're not discrepancies. What they reveal is a different group of people he's speaking to at different times. And it's an application to the end of days, but it also helps reveal things in the was as well. OK. Then from that is how the Lord then revealed that the end of days wasn't just the final set of seven years, but the final two sets of seven years, okay? That's what all this is about. Here's the seven easy that we're just coming to the end of right now, okay? These seven years right here, we are waiting to the 17th of July, and then there will be 50 days left from... And we've known this. This is why it's so perfect this year. Everything equals it. Okay. The last 50 days right here bring us from the 8th of Av. Uh, sorry, the 9th of Av 
to the year's end. Literally the 29th day of Elul, when the Holy Spirit will come at the year's end. The attack of Israel will follow, the, the second attack on Israel will follow. One will be at the beginning of the 50 days. One will come at the end of 50 days. And that second one will scatter them for the next seven years because of their disobedience. That's why the temple won't get built till the first three and a half years of trumpets. But seals is for the, the portion of the church that wasn't ready. The 90% that were sleeping. Okay? Those who get to vanish like Enoch did. It said they first believed that he was God and that he was a rewarder of them that diligently sought him. Okay? So if you know a bunch of Christians that aren't seeking the Lord, they're just, ah, eh, whatever. I don't believe it's going to happen. One of our brothers, his wife is like that. I don't believe it's coming. He's not coming to take anybody. It's not now. You see? There's a big difference between those diligently seeking the Lord right? Sleeping Christians. And it's because of the way the harvest work, guys. It's a 10% that goes to the Lord first. Then the 90% of the field, everything is taken later. And that portion gets beaten with a tribulum. A tribulum is called tribulation. <laughs> That's where the word comes from. It gets beaten on the tribulum. Okay. That's the main harvest. And then you got the little bit left over the corners and the gleanings. That's even later. Okay, so right here, this is the, the final 50 days. Then you got the time of seals and the time of trumpets. Okay, it, it's, it's all there. You will see for yourself that the tribulation is a seven-year final portion for the church and a seven-year final portion for Judah. Okay, all you got to do is spend 30 minutes in each and you will see and have questions answered that I'm sure you have wondered about for decades. Okay? Watch the third one then when you have time. The third one will reveal how these things were missed. Why were these things missed for so long? And the answer is because everybody was taught as a foundation of all scripture that Matthew was where we base everything from. That caused all the problems. You see, if you're at if you're considering Matthew and everything you study is Matthew, well then guess what that means? That means there's only 7 years left. The rapture, the great multitude, the main harvest comes in and then it's Jacob's trouble, the time of rebuilding the city and the streets and the temple, you see? That's exactly right if you study Matthew. But then what's happened is you've missed who Mark was to. You've missed who Luke was speaking to. Luke is speaking to the bride of Christ. Mark is speaking to the sleeping church. And Matthew is speaking to Judah. You'll understand that in these three videos. Mind-blowing stuff. And you'll see that pre-, mid-, and post-tribulation are all true. Come and watch this video after those three. You'll see that it's the pre-trib escape of the bride. The mid-trib rapture of the sleeping church. Not the bride. They're not the bride. They're the sleeping church. They're the invitees, you could say. And then it's the return of the Lord, feet down on the Mount of Olives. It's the answer to 2 Corinthians 12 when Paul's talking. All right? So with that, I definitely needed to spend a little bit of time in there because there's some new people. All right? So let's now show this, this count of what I'm talking about. For those that, that aren't aware, the Lord has revealed to us this bull. Okay? The bull. He revealed to us that... The end time code, which is called 501450. One of the Lord's names, one of the Father's names is Noon. And Noon, the 14th letter in the Hebrew alphabet, means, okay, the 14th letter Noon equals on their numbers, pictograph, uh, on their numbers, the 14th letter equals 50. And there was a revelation that we got that the Lord gave since last March. And in that revelation was all pointing to the bullseye, to the bull, to being right on target. It was all about the bull. And we've definitely figured out what the Lord was trying to tell us. Okay? Don't go watch this video for new people. 
that's for those that understand what's been going on here. All right. It's all about the bull in this second time. And the reason I bring it up about the bull is because like everybody else, we were saying, well, maybe the, the connection had to be to Passover. We knew because of who the Gospels are speaking to that when we go to the resurrection story of Luke, because Luke is to the bride of Christ, Mark is to the sleeping church rapture, Matthew is to the is to Judah when the Lord returns feet down. We knew that there was a connection to the resurrection story and uh, uh, the bride of Christ. Well, when March came and went, and there was nothing at Resurrection Day, right, for Resurrection Day, we thought, well, what the heck's going on? And we said, okay, well, you know, maybe it's the Enoch calendar. So we got another chance. We, we can come down to the end of April. And Resurrection Day came and went, and there was nothing. And then we started to realize, because the Lord had been working on me since last March, and we knew it wasn't it wasn't a, a huge surprise about the bull because for over a year now, the Lord was revealing to us this understanding of the bull. And the bull was just like Christ in the beginning. Okay, remember the whole Hebrew alphabet? The beginning. Number one, beginning is Aleph. That's the ox, the bull. Christ is the beginning and the end. When Enoch was vanished, at his time, it was the time of the bull. At the time of Adam, at the creation of Adam, and during that time when all those guys lived, it was during the time of the bull. Okay, that was the revelation that the the beginning of the year, the spring equinox, and the beginning of Nisan happened in the bull. Well, that's why this year we we're we're now in Pisces at the spring equinox when Christ was here. It was in Aries, but back when it, and and sorry and and back when it was Adam, it was in the ox. So in the beginning is revealed the end, and the end in the beginning. The Lord had revealed to us that the beginning of the end is from the resurrection story at the time of the bull. This began. This here saying the third month, Savan, is not Savan according to the Lord God. Is not, is not the third month according to the Lord God. But on the Hebrew calendar, it had to equal what the Lord had told them. This is why it's so amazing. So on the Lord's calendar, this is the count of the resurrection story. And this is where we began to know to count. So from resurrection, the Lord, uh, we knew the revelation now of the Feast of Weeks. And so here's the resurrection story. And it says, how many, how many weeks? One, okay? The Sabbath. Two. Uh, da, 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 da. Three, okay? The eighth the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th of every month. You see, that's why the Lord didn't say count 49 days and then count 50 days. Why say count seven times seven and then add 50 days? Could have just said, uh, okay, seven times seven is 49. Count 49, count 99 days. You see, there was a reason. It's because the weeks, it said from Sabbath to Sabbath. But the new months, there's the new moon, which is dark. Okay? The Jews don't count their Sabbaths properly. Most know it, too. Okay? So what do we end up seeing? So where's Sabbath number one? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So July 17th was the 8th of Av, which equals the escape day, which is when they bring in a new meat offering, which is the wheat harvest, the first fruits. And guess what? The next day is the 9th of Av. And Leviticus 26 said, And from the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall you number 50 days. Okay? 
shall you number 50 days. So you're going to count 50 from the 18th of July. You're going to add 50 days and look at where it takes us to September 6th. What's September 6th? The last day of the year, which scripture told us at the year's end is when is when uh, uh, Assyria will come, is when the lion will come, having surrounded them, will then come and attack at the year's end. The Holy Ghost will give the anointing to those chosen to work seals with uh, for the Lord. And then right here at the year's end to the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, the, first, uh, the second attack on Israel and Jerusalem will take place and they will be removed from the land and scattered for the next seven years from Jerusalem. The beginning of the year is trumpets. But, but do you see why it's so fascinating? Because there is no way, any possibility whatsoever, that if the count was from Nisan on the Hebrew calendar, or from IR on the Enoch calendar, nothing would have equaled the count that brought us to 717, to which the scriptures told us the ninth of Av, the Israelites or the Jews would never, ever again observe after having done it for 70 years. They will never again observe the fasting of the ninth of Av and the third of Tishri, which is the Gedalia one, the fast of the seventh month. Like I said before, they put it at the, at the third day, but we know from having studied history that it actually happened at the Feast of Trumpets. Okay, They observe it here because they don't want it to to coincide with the Feast of Trumpets because that's its own celebration. So they moved it to the day after. But it actually happened on the Feast of Trumpets. You see what I'm saying? There's no way. Now you say, well, why was this so important with Tishbav? Okay? With, uh, with the ninth of Av, when Israel's been destroyed and all these other times in history. Why did it matter for those that are new? <clears throat> Because the revelation of Zechariah that has 14 chapters is written to the Jews, is written to Judah. Hosea has 14 chapters as well. They're the only two with 14 chapters in all the Bible. And they're written to the Gentiles. Okay? When you come to here and you see in chapter 1, it said these 70 years. In chapter 7, it tells us those 70 years. So for 70 years, you fasted and you mourned in the fifth and in the seventh month, meaning for the last seven years, you have not done it because it ended after having done it for 70 years. That means that this time, right now, this year, they will not observe the ninth of of fasting and mourning because they're going to be attacked. You follow? Now, for those that are new and they say, well, how is it? It's like Israel's already turned 73. That, you have to go watch another video. Go read Leviticus chapter, nine, chapter 19, and you'll understand that for the first three years when they came into the land, they weren't allowed to take anything from it. Okay? It's because it's three years and then 70 years, everything begins. Okay? So 73 years had to pass, but really it's three. And then the 70 began, and that's how we got that this year in the spring, when they turned 73, they had completed the three, they had completed the 70. Now it's all about where the Lord God is counting from. And how amazing is it that the revelation of the ox, the bull, the bullseye, and everything we were given then revealed to us the proper count for the Feast of Weeks of seven times seven, then 50 days, and it literally gave us the beginning of the count to when the first attack would happen, to when the Holy Ghost would come, and the second attack would take place, and it would be the beginning of the 14 years. You know how awesome that is? 
It's impossible to have understood that count without understanding where the Lord God is beginning his count. You see, it still had to equal what the scripture said on their calendar. And it does. Absolutely 100% perfect. And equals his head of the year. You see, it's called Rosh Hashanah. Right? The Feast of Trumpets is called Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. You see that? That is also the Lord God's New Year. This is where you see they change from 5781 to 5782. So as much as the Lord God has Nisan for the beginning of the year, Rosh Hashanah was also a beginning of the year. And do you know what? Back in the days of Enoch, do you know when the beginning of the year was? When, 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 um, uh, 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 well, back in the day, it was Rosh Hashanah. The seventh month used to be the first month. Remember the whole clock thing we talked about a long time ago? One equals seven, three equals nine. This is where the Lord God's beginning everything. This is, according to the Lord God, this is Pentecost. This is the end. This is the 50th day. And this is the beginning of trumpets. You're going to see when we get to this to this greater understanding how incredible it is that it actually had to start on the Feast of Trumpets. Now, as we were saying, you know, how is it possible that in Scripture it was to equal 7 times 7 and then 50? Okay, that's kind of, that's always been the mystery. Because when we read the last chapter of Luke, Mark, and Matthew, the whole story is the res, uh, the the taking of Christ, his death and resurrect, uh, his death and crucifixion, and then his resurrection. Okay, so it looked like it only it only pertained to when he resurrected, and then he was here for forty days. But it's been completely misunderstood, and the reason it's been completely misunderstood is because we never understood how to properly count the Feast of Weeks. Remember, as we talked recently, it was because of Constantine. Because of Constantine, you know, whatever, 1,500 or so years ago, it's because of that, that they removed the counting of weeks, and all they did was just number 50 days. They lost the first half in their history of seven times seven, but they still call it seven times seven, and then they just number the 50th day. Completely not what the scripture says. But now when you understand this, look at look at what this is telling us here. The seven, what we call easy years, doesn't mean everybody's life was easy, but what we call the seven easy years is when Jacob was working for Rachel, expecting to get Rachel, right? But he got Leah. But he said those years flew by. This is so awesome. He says those years flew by. He was so excited to work for her. So there's no tribulation in this time. Just working hard to get the bride, working hard to get the bride, and you're so excited, everything just flies by. That's Luke. But you notice it's still a seven-year count. Then what? Then he gets her. The wedding takes place, and then his father-in-law also gives him Rachel after that wedding week. But he still has to put in seven years for Rachel before she starts having kids. So what do we have here? Mark has a portion of time of seven, and then Matthew has a portion of time of seven. And what are these sevens? What are all these sevens? They are the true jubilee count. Not there, There's jubilee counts to when Jerusalem came about. There's all these different jubilee counts. Right? My wife just turned 50. Oh, that's a jubilee count for her. But there is a big picture jubilee count. And that big picture jubilee count lines up perfectly from Christ's uh, uh, birth to his coming return, and then the jubilee which follows. 
So you see, it's these seventh, it's these Sabbath years. These Sabbath years, Sabbath years, Sabbath years. We counted all of the Sabbath years since Christ's birth. And it lined up that we're now in the seventh. Yes, we're still in the 2020, 2021 range, remember? Going fall to fall, okay? Yes, we used to think it was spring to spring, but now we've got the revelation. Fall to fall. And then what happens? From fall of 2021, the 14 years begins. What are they? The last sets of seven. See, the last sets of seven since what? Since the last Jubilee. See? So what are we looking at? is the final two sevens in the entire picture. They're the final two sets of seven, and then it'll be the Jubilee year. You see? So why am I saying that? Because in Luke, Mark, and Matthew, when we go to the story and we see it in the was, it was Mark, it was Matthew who was first. It was Mark that was second. It was Luke that was third in the synoptics. So if we take it forward and we looked at the story of the resurrection, here we see the story of the resurrection. We see that it's got a different count compared to Mark and, and Luke's actually. But look at the commission. He meets them at the mountain. Some doubted. He said, all power is given unto him in heaven on earth. He doesn't tell them to wait for the Holy Spirit. He tells them to go out and teach. And he tells them, hey, I'm with you even until the end of the world. We know the deeper meaning of that in relation to the very end, right? But we're talking about the was. So this doesn't sound like the same group that we read about in Mark. In Mark, their commission is very different. And he's actually upset with them at first because they didn't believe the, the testimony of the two witnesses. But when they go out, they're told to baptize and signs would follow them and they could take up serpents and everything. The, that the Lord is now sitting at the right hand. He's going to confirm them with signs following. This is completely different than what we read about the resurrection story over in Matthew. And so when you realize, you say, well, wait a second. We understand the, the end times portion of it, but what did it mean in the was when Christ was here? Because the end time portion is because at the end of Luke's, it's the 50 days. At the end of Mark's, that's the 144,000 rapture of the church. At the end of, and that's when the Lord's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's there on Mount Zion. At the end of Matthew, that's when the Lord will now be here until the end of the world when the millennial reign is done. But in the was, there had to be something else going on. Because then when you come to Luke, <clears throat> this is in Luke, it's the only group that he tells them they have to wait until the Father, uh, um, uh, uh, they have to wait for the promise of the Father that will anoint them, right? That's when the Holy Spirit comes. So we know it's the reference to the to the 50th day. But the 50 days doesn't happen until he's left and we see that he's ascended. You see that? So this is the only group that's told 50 days to wait for the Father. And what they're told is completely different from Mark and from Matthew. The revelation of this was what? Well, in the end, it goes in reverse. It's Luke, Mark, and Matthew. So it was seven times seven, or seven and seven. And then Luke had the 50 days. Well, in reverse, look at what we have. The 50 days of Luke, seven and seven, but not in a, in a day we count but in the year count. So it starts with a 50-day count, seven times seven in the year count, and it will end with a 50 jubilee. It's all in order. This was a huge, huge revelation. It was the answer to the Feast of Weeks. But the, the way it all came about, for those that are newer, is right here. 1 Corinthians 15, 4 through 8. 
Okay, here's the resurrection. He rose on the third day, and it says, and that he was seen of Caiaphas, then of the 12. And it says, after that, he was seen of a larger group, and after that, he was seen of the apostles. Well, hold on a second. We've been taught that that resurrection story was all the same 12 people in the 50-day portion of him being there for for 40 days and then leaving to the Holy Ghost. It's not. Luke's portion was. This is Luke's workers group right here being chosen to work seals. So in the was, it was the 12. That's Matthew's group. Then the greater portion, the larger number, that's the end of Mark's group. And this, after that, was Luke's group. These were the apostles anointed and those disciples that were with them. So in the end, what is it? It's one born out of due time, the Enoch escape of the bride. It's the apostles that will be anointed. And then at the end of seals, it'll be the 144,000. And at the end of trumpets, it's the heads of the 12 tribes who go out during the millennial reign. It was all revealed in order. Forward and backward. That was, the, that was the whole revelation of this mystery, of the ministry. It was forward and backward. What was in the beginning will be in the end. You see, we, we got that scripture. We all know that one too, don't we? The thing that has been, Ecclesiastes 1.9, the thing that has been, it is that shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done There is no new thing under the sun. Hello. See that? There'll be nothing new. What was will be. The end is in the beginning. The beginning is in the end. It's just, it's incredible. And we've taught on these things recently. But I know that there's some people that wanted a little bit of clarity to say, well, how do we account for that within the Gospels? The Gospels makes it look like it's the same story of the of the resurrection, right? That it's resurrection, he resurrected on this day, he resurrected on this day, and then these things began. But clearly, there were different groups. The wording is different groups. Where they meet is different groups. Uh, uh, what they're commissioned to do is different. But it wasn't until 1 Corinthians 15 that we were revealed that, in fact, they were three different groups. Okay? Now, this leads us in to this this video and what um what uh, 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 Pearl had done, and it's really quite awesome. It's only a thirty minute video. You should go watch the the whole video, but I want to show a clip of about two and a half or so minutes because within it you'll see another clue given to us about that big picture I was telling you about, that that 21,000, 22,000 year picture, right? The 22nd will be the eternity, okay? That new eighth day that will go on for eternity. So that means there are 21,000, 7,000, 7,000, 7,000 that were from the beginning. Just like there was seven years, seven years, and seven years, okay? They're the last three of, of the bigger picture, but they're the ones given to us in all sorts of things. Okay? So we're going to we're going to touch on that here. And you guys are going to see uh for yourselves. And another reason we're so excited, it's like that of the video I did back in 2019, there's one still posted that says uh there's no other year, right? And I've got 2019 on it. I'm not I don't take it down. I'm not ashamed to leave that one up because we understood We just needed the proper year count of the 70th. We needed a few other things as well, of course, but it wasn't until the true understanding of the 70th that all of these things started to all come together and and fit like like a perfect glove, okay? And now, remember, this is about Pearl in 717 and having watched our video, tying it into what she had revealed, what she had understood before. And in fact, let me show you this. Uh, I'll show you that when we get there. I, I wasn't sure if it was in that clip. Okay, let's listen to this and what she says. I'm going to show you something amazing here. So in this, I'll have to take you to the interlinear Bible because if you notice here, right, that if you uh, read the Bible in Hebrew, right, so what do you see? 
the first verse of uh, Genesis is Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim wa et hades. Okay, that is how many words are there? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So in the first verse of Genesis, you have seven words. Similarly, in the second verse of Genesis, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, thirteen and fourteen. All right, so on and so forth. All right, did you see that? I'm going to pause it right there. We'll continue on in, in a moment. But I want to show you guys something. This is what she's talking about. Genesis 1.1 in the inner linear, inner linear Bible. Here's the Hebrew on how it's read. Okay, they go from right to left. Remember, just like 7.17, the name of God. So what do you have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So in the very first verse of Genesis, there are seven words okay in the very first verse of genesis there are seven words then you go to verse 2 of genesis and in verse 2 of genesis you see there are 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 Another mystery hidden in Genesis. What's after the first seven? Fourteen. So what do you have? Seven and fourteen. Guys, that's the revelation of this ministry. And do you want to know why that's so awesome? Because in the recent video I did, I don't know if it was this one or this one, but we've even talked about it in the past. It's the mystery or, or the revealing, you could say, that just like the book of Revelation, like I said earlier, has 22 chapters. That the Hebrew alphabet is 22 letters. That the revelation of the end of days, that the complete picture is 22 years. The entirety of that revelation proves what? What is it, what is it showing us? What I said in that previous video. That there's been a mystery in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 into verse 2. And that is when it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then all of a sudden people say, it seems like things changed. That from 1 into 2, it's believed that there's something has happened. And we've talked about this before. I believe that just like the type and shadow of Jacob, who was so excited to work his first seven years, or, or as Christ to work the first 7,000 years, let's not forget, to the Lord, it's not 7,000 years. It's to man, if we were in time as we are now, and we were looking at it at creation, we would look at it as if it was 7,000 years. But remember what we were told in 2 Peter 3, 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Okay? Meaning that this creation of heaven and earth was a seven-day process, was to us what would have appeared to be 7,000. But the Lord, you see, because this is Jesus' name right here, the beginning, the first fruit, 7225. In Christ, God created the heaven and the earth. So Jesus made that creation of the heaven and the earth. He did it. And it was a total of seven days or 7,000 years to us. This has always been a mystery. Well, it would appear that we could prove it. Because not only does the end reveal the beginning, the beginning reveals the end. <laughs> Do you follow? Seven and 14. Seven in the first portion of creation, 14 in what followed. And what revealed at the end? 7 and 14. It's the answer. It's another piece that we can add to the answer. How is that? 
We can understand that there is this mystery of creation. The end reveals it, and Jacob helps us confirm it as well on top of the count of the number of words in Hebrew from verse 1 to verse 2 in the beginning. I find that fascinating. Just fascinating. Well, now watch what else um, uh, 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 Pearl has. Listen to this. I plotted plot the verses, verses, okay, and the number of words. And what did I find? I found that Genesis verse 1 had 7 words, Genesis verse 2 had 14, 3 had 6, 4 had 12, 5 had 14, 6 had 11, and 7th verse of Genesis had 17 words. This is not a... Now, so this was something that she discovered after watching our last video, Ministry Revealed, the 717 video. But what it does is it confirmed what she had found four years ago in the story of Lamentations. Okay, for that, you can go watch the whole video. But she found that the seventh verse in Genesis 1 had 17 letters, uh, 17 words. And why does it matter? What's the big deal? Because it said, God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under from the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And so it was. This is why I'm telling you, you want to go watch her video because her revelation that she had of this of this whole count from from uh, 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 um, Lamentations. <laughs> it's so awesomely connected. What she had in the in what was revealed in Lamentations and what she put together was the story of when the waters, when the Lord would take his orphans and divide them from the waters below and place to the waters above. And in Genesis, it's 717. But do you know what the book of Lamentations and where it's talking about this in Lamentations? Is they're lamenting and they're crying because of the destruction of the ninth of Av. Hello! <laughs> it's so crazy. Man, <laughs> it's awesome. Let's keep listening. My brothers and sisters, okay? okay? Because what does, so that, what say? does that say? So Genesis, this was, is, it talks about, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. It's talking about a division of waters. Okay, what did we find in the code in Lamentations? We found that the same message was given that God, to remember the inheritance of the orphans, our father, our God, will be dividing the waters above the world, right? Above Egypt, this world. The father Abba and Yeshua, the servant of servants, will take the souls who are naked and dress them to be his bride. And the same thing is quoted in Bereshit, because in Bereshit, verse number seven gives us this, right? How amazing is that? Okay, verse number seven has 17 words in it in the Hebrew, in the Torah, all right? Genesis 1 7 has the code 717, right? Now, I hope this blows uh, your mind, Brother Ellen, and all those uh, who are part of the ministry revealed. Uh, so these are the three sets of codes. That's awesome. Another 717 code splitting the waters from above from the waters below that equaled what she found back a few years ago in lamentations and the revelation of it was when god would take those orphans and separate them from the waters above from the waters below to the waters above and as i just said they were mourning this right here man <laughs> you see why this stuff is so exciting it just, you think, what more is the Lord going to give? How is this possible to get any more? But at the same time, of course, we know the Lord can do this all day long for eternity in his word. Mystery upon mystery, things hidden within things hidden, revelation upon revelation. But I'll tell you what, all of it, every last single bit of it, all of it, is equaling 717 of 2021. Every single piece, every little mystery we were trying to tick off, every piece that we did understand, but we hadn't gotten the year. We were trying to see, well, how would the count equal to us going before the ninth of Av attack? Is there gonna be like, is gonna be like 50 days or 40 days before? And then the attack of the ninth of Av, is there gonna be two? Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't fully lining up. Until finally, the Lord revealed why he was giving us the bull. Incredible stuff.
All of this couldn't have happened, guys. Oh, people are getting dates and they're getting numbers or they're getting events and things happening. And it's what happened with Pearl, right? With Pearl, uh, like I said, I think she was looking at a rainbow with her daughter or something. And she audibly heard 717. And that was a few years ago. The problem is <laughs> we love those things, but now you got to figure out what the mystery is, right? So I think uh, hopefully, prayerfully, as she helped give us a little bit more energy as well that in showing that there's even more connected to it, I pray that uh, these have given her the, the strength to, to keep pushing forward as well and understanding that we are here. This is it. All right. So now we've got the big picture for real. Now we've got the in-between picture. And now let's take it a little bit more forward. And let me show you something that's really awesome. Or, or <laughs> it's devastating to think about, but in, in the revelation of the end, it's also incredible. Because as I showed you earlier, when it comes, or we spoke about earlier, when it comes to the Gospels, and in particular the Synoptic Gospels, there's always this, this, this idea that there's these discrepancies. And everybody here in this ministry that's been following at least for a little while knows of these discrepancies, ha has, has been trying to understand these discrepancies all of their adult life of seeking scripture, right? How is it? One of the, one of the, big, one of the ones that's well known as well, now we're going to talk about the, the Judas one, but the other one that's really well known is Jonah. You know, how is it possible that in Luke, the Lord said he would be as Jonah was for 40 days, and in Matthew, he says he'll be as Jonah three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. But in Mark, he said, you guys aren't getting anything. And he got in the ship and he left. That's a discrepancy. Okay, that's something that makes people say, well, how is this playing out? Because you know what? We don't have this harmony of the gospels taking place. You see, there is no harmony of the gospels. In fact, you can come look at it right here. What's it called? Da -da 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 -da. They call it harmony of the gospels. So if you guys want to go look at things, they they put the events or the same stories close together to let you know there's the one here, 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 here. But there's no harmony within it. They don't they don't understand why it's this. It's very very much like a discrepancy. You can't account for it, and I believe. That is the reason that the church said the foundation and in, 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 uh, Bible schools and everything else, seminaries, they, the foundation was, hey, we got three Gospels. Matthew was the one decided upon, and the other two were used as reference points. Okay? So much so that when we come over here, listen to, remember I said I was going to tell you a little bit about C.S. Lewis. Well, listen to what these guys said. And it still goes on today. That's why what we have is so powerful. That is why my, my biggest desire is just to get it out to as many big voices or bigger voices or any voice that will let more and more and more people know. Because this is the mystery that they've all desired. All the seminaries, all of the, the, the hundreds and hundreds of years, this is what they've been desiring to know. Listen to this. Right here, the discrepancy between the two accounts of Judas's death in Matthew 27 and in Acts chapter 1 has proven to be a serious challenge for those who support the idea of biblical inerrancy. Okay, that the Bible that the Bible is without error. So anybody who's stand who's standing there saying. On, on the idea that the that the Bible has you know no errors in it, this is something with Judas that causes a big problem. Okay, listen to what it says. This problem was one of the points C.S. Lewis, for example, um, uh, 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 sorry, this problem was one of the points leading to C.S. Lewis, for example, to reject the view that every statement in Scripture must be historical truth. What? Because they couldn't understand 
because there's these discrepancies within the Bible and they couldn't understand them, these huge names whose shoulders many of us stand on, these these Bible scholars and, and people of old that studied these things, they said, well, we don't have to take everything for, for inerrancy. We don't have to take it as a literal fact or a literal truth. You see, even someone like C.S. Lewis. Why? Because just like the pastors that are out there now, like Pastor Sandy attacking Ministry Revealed again, doing it on Facebook, doing it in his recent videos, he's, first of all, he's never watched anything we've done outside of the very first video on the mark of the beast. He attacks by saying things we've never said because he just repeats what somebody tells him. His biggest defense against our ministry is just saying, that's just crazy, that guy's crazy. That's his, that's his best defense, that's all he's ever said, you see? But a whole bunch of his viewers keep coming to him and saying, you need to check this ministry out. There's some awesome connections being revealed. But all he has to say is, that's crazy. And do you know why? Because they are stuck in what they know. They know Matthew. I'm not against uh, uh, Pastor Sandy. I'm sad and I'm disappointed and I'm hurt, but I don't hate Pastor Sandy. He's a brother. Look at what he does. And he loves the Lord and he loves teaching and he loves showing the people. Right? That, I'm not upset with that. I don't like his attacking because he won't take the time to at least watch those two 30-minute videos and, and humble himself to pay attention as he does. It's the same thing. Do you see what was going on in this statement back then? Because it wasn't understood. Man says, well, we don't have to take all of it as actual truth. We don't have to take all of it as inerrancy. We don't have to take all of it as 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 literally happened or maybe will happen hello that's what these pastors are doing today that's what many of these other teachers are doing today they will literally read <laughs> daniel chapter 12 verse 4 that in the end of days the books would open they literally read from it and then somebody presents them the books being opened and they just say, ah, you're crazy. I don't have the time. Ah, you don't know what you're talking about. They're doing the same thing. They think that everything is already understood and that nobody will come with anything else to be understood with greater understanding. Yet they read that same verse from Daniel as everybody else does. You see, they get caught up in thinking, well, we already know it. Why else would, why else would C.S. Lewis have said a statement like this? To, to reject the view that every statement in Scripture must be historical truth. He rejected that every statement must be historical truth. Because the thought is, we are so well versed. We know the Scriptures like the back of our hands. So it must be a discrepancy. It must not be literal. Ah, don't share this stuff with me. I already know it. There's no way it could be who the Gospels are speaking to in 14 years. You see? Maybe that's why all you guys are listening. Maybe that's why we, we receive the truth. Because we were all seeking to understand those things and not just reject it because of inerrancy or not perfectly accurate or whatever the case may be. None of us thought that we just knew everything. We followed where the Spirit was leading us in the Scripture, and it is the Spirit that led the entirety of this ministry. Oh, yeah, we get excited and see dates along the way, but that's what watchmen do. They have to call it out. But the entire revelation of the story of the end has been revealing itself since September 8th, 2017. And all we want them to do is stop thinking they know everything and that it's already been revealed because we know it wasn't yet revealed. All right? It's being revealed now. It had to be revealed before the end began. You get it? 
It had to. So that nobody can come back to the Lord and say, well, why didn't anybody get it? How come nobody understood? How was this possible? This is that story. This is that story with, with Judas. It goes on to say, nonetheless, various attempts at harmonization have been suggested. Uh, generally, they have followed literary interpretations of Augustine Hippo. You see, they, they, they came up with all these ways. How, well, how is it possible? Oh, well, Judas must have been hanging himself uh, 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 where the tree limb was, was, was hanging over the edge of a cliff <laughs> and, and the branch broke or the tree broke and then he went down and he splattered. How about there was more to come? How about pausing and saying, we just maybe haven't understood it yet, that there was more to be revealed in the end? That would have been a much better thing to say, right? Than to say, uh, maybe just everything in the scripture isn't actually historically accurate. You see, this, brothers and sisters, is how powerful the revelation is that we've been given here. It's not me. I couldn't do this stuff. It's just the Spirit guiding. Read it and you, you just start to understand it. And then you see it and everything starts connecting. And it's this big jigsaw puzzle coming together. It's incredible. So now, what does this then mean to the story in the end? How is it that in Acts chapter 1, this is where he gushed out. Like, did you read this before? Have you guys ever read this? Listen to this in Acts chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. <laughs> oh man, that's pretty descriptive, right? And it was known unto all dwellers at Jerusalem insomuch as the field is called in the proper tongue uh, Akladema, that is to say, the field of blood. Now, this is the one that has already happened. Of that, there's no doubt. We know this is the one where, it, where it's happened. The issue now is, what about what took place in the Gospel of Matthew? You see, in Matthew, in chapter 27, this is where it gets very fascinating. In Matthew tw chapter 27, let's read. Uh, verse 3 through 8. Then Judas, uh, sorry, then Judas which betrayed him, when he saw that he was co condemned, repented himself. Wait a second, he repented. Let that sink in for a moment. He repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood and they say, what is it to us? Uh, see thou to that. And he cast the 30 pieces of silver into the temple and departed and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the 30 pieces of silver. Okay, They didn't want to put it in the treasury. It was unlawful because it was the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought them a potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, therefore, the field was called the, val the field of blood unto this day. Verse 9, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, and that they took the 30 pieces of silver, uh, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and they bought a potter's field. Now, here's the thing, of course. It's about what's going on here with Judas. How is this possible that his gut splattered out and yet over here he hung himself? Is, is there more to this story going on? Was, was it a prophecy? Was it, was it tied in that, yes, this happened over here, yet how is it connected that he hangs himself over here, guts over here, hangs himself here? What's going on? Well, that is the revelation of the Gospels. 
That is the importance of who the Gospels are speaking to. And in particular, the Synoptic Gospels. This is why Jesus, when everybody, anybody brings up the question, well, what do you mean? How can you show it? Like, what's an easy one? I always go to the colors of the robes. That's the best one to show everybody with. And that is, uh, in Luke, when Jesus went to the cross, he was covered, he was given a gorgeous white robe. In Mark, it said he was arrayed in purple. In Matthew, it said he was given a, a scarlet robe. Well, which one was it? You see, when they talk about discrepancies, that's one as well. In fact, if you ask any pastor, we've never found one pastor that even re recognized that was there. And the reason they haven't is because 90% of their focus in Scripture when it comes to the Gospels is Matthew. So you'll never find one, as far as I know, the dozens that, that we've been shared or spoken to, not one of them ever knew that there was another color. Okay, so that's a great example. So what does this have to do with Matthew? What does this have to do with Judas and him talking about this in Matthew? Well, you'll notice you don't find it in Mark. You see, it just says Judas is carried, one of the 12. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. That's it. This is the story of Judas here. So in Mark's gospel, they, Judas was there. He told him about Jesus. The, he told the chief priests about Jesus. He betrayed him. And they promised to give him money. There was no money. Just the promise of money, right? But in Matthew, there was money. It literally says 30 pieces of silver right here. Okay, So he was given 30 pieces of silver. And of course, we know he hangs himself. When we go to Luke's story, it's right here. Then entered Satan into Judas Iscariot, being of the 12, number to the 12. And he went and communed with the chief priests and captain and betrayed him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted with him to give him money. Again, nothing about his death. Nothing about the amount of money. Nothing about being given the money. So what's happening here? There, there's, there's something, something's different, right? There has to be a reason to this difference. Well, how about if we go to the story of John? Even if we, so we come out of the Synoptic Gospels and we go into John, can we get more hints by going into John? Well, in the Gospels, the, this is the last place, verse 5 of John 18, is the last place you hear about Judas. And what do we know? This is why it's so important, brothers and sisters. I don't call this the third key, right? The open books. I call this the, you can say, the third most important, where the Gospels, the revelation of the Gospels was the first key. And that key gave us then and led us to the second key, which was the 14 years that led us to the big picture within uh, that within the 14 of which the 14 years is in. But those two keys are what got us in the house. Those are what got us into the scriptures and opened up all of these things, including all of these books. It's the reason why unbeknownst to those who wrote these things in ancient times or, or hundreds of years ago, however you want to look at it, that they've called the synoptic gospels and had John separately. Why? Because the synoptic gospels are Luke, Mark, and Matthew. They're the pre-trib set up to take out the bride. It's the, the seals, the mid-trib time of the rapture for Mark. And then Matthew is to the Jew is to Judah. And when the Lord will return. Why isn't John there? Because John has given us the big picture. John is speaking to us. And within his book, his 21 chapters equal revelations within them of events over the 21 years. And that's why right at the end of the seven or start of the eighth, 
you see a woman before him, him bent on one knee. You see, it's the bride of Christ standing before him, just like the end of Luke's discourse, chapter 21 says. Early in the morning, it went to the Lord. Okay, that's why it's there. When you go to 14 of John, you see that the Lord said, ah, when I return, I'll return with a place prepared. That where I go, I go and prepare a place. And when I return, I'll receive you. Well, look at where it is. This is when he's going to receive the rapture group. When I Where I go, I'm going to prepare a place. And when I return, I'll receive you unto myself. What happens in chapter 20? Chapter 20 is his resurrection story. Do you know why it's his resurrection story? Because his crucifixion story starts in chapter 18. It's like the half year, right? Halfway through. And then what? Two more years. It's two and a half years. So what happens in this two and a half years? It's, that's when Messiah is cut off. In the end of days, this is when Messiah is cut off. This is when Messiah is cut off. And it just so happens it's the story of the taking of Christ and his crucifixion and his resurrection in the 20th chapter. It's the two and a half years of the end. So you see, John is giving us that big picture within it. And where do we see Judas for the last time in the Gospels? Right here. And Judas also, verse 2 through 5. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times res uh, resorted thither with his disciples. Judas, having received a band of men and officers, right, and lanterns, torches, weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth. Jesus said unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. This is the last time in the Gospels that you see the name Judas. Do you think that's just willy-nilly by chance that it's, that it's in chapter 18 of John? Knowing what we know about the ox, the bull, and, and the sacrifice for atonement that's coming? This is literally the year. Right here. The 18th chapter is literally the timing of the sacrifice of the ox. After the city and the streets and the temple have been rebuilt for three and a half years, then it's time to sacrifice the red heifer. So where are we at? Chapter 18. Where does Judas end? In chapter 18. Well. What's he doing here in 18 if really in Acts chapter 1, which is where he was where he was killed the first time or where he killed himself the first time, which was that valley of blood because his guts splattered everywhere. Why do we see his story in John 18 when we know John is the revelation of the end of days? Is there a mystery? You think maybe there's a mystery that that these guys didn't understand? That we were willing, we were open because we were seeking the revelation of the Lord? And that we received keys and all these books began to open? So we can prove this even further. We should be able to confirm this in another book. But more than that, what period of time is this? This is Matthew's time. If this is Luke's time where the Holy Spirit has been working to, to wake up the bride of Christ, okay, which is what this is, and then the bride leaves, the Gentile bride leaves, then you've got 14 years, the first seven are seals to Israel slash sleeping church, right? The world, you could say. Then you've got the seven years of trumpets, which are to Judah. And what do we know? Everybody who studies with the foundation of Matthew, they think the tribulation is only seven years long, and it's going to start with what? The rebuilding of the city and the streets for and the temple for three and a half years. Well, that's exactly correct. 
The problem is they incorporate it with the time of seals. And so they tell everybody that the Jews are going to fall for the Antichrist because it's the Antichrist that's going to build the temple and then stand in it and declare himself God. What they've done is they've combined the seven of seals with the false prophet and Antichrist to the time when Christ is here on heavenly Mount Zion and the city and the streets are being rebuilt in the temple to the time when Satan's going to be kicked out, having lost his battle against Michael and his angels. And the last two and a half years to the end of 20 or the end of 13 is where Satan will have stepped in after Messiah being cut off as the red bull sacrifice, you see, as the red heifer who has to be three to four years old, which is exactly three and a half years at the time of his cutoff. So we should be able to prove this in a couple more places. We should be able to find another confirmation within the, the open books. and. We should also be able to find it because the relation is trumpets time. And trumpets is to Matthew. You see where I'm going? (laughs) It's not too hard to see where this is going, right? It just said trumpets time is to Matthew. And the mystery of the hanging is the one that really isn't understood yet. Where is it speaking about? Matthew. Matthew is the one that talks about him hanging himself. Matthew is the one that talks about him receiving 30 pieces of silver and having them bought a field and so forth. This is where you get all the details in Matthew. Do you think that that it's it's just lacking information in the other two? Or was it put into Matthew with greater detail for a reason. The reason was the revelation of the open books we've received. You see, the revelation is how John is the chapters to years. It's the reason why he's here. Because this is Matthew's time. So in Matthew 27, talking about what? Well, look, it's when they came to take Christ. So it's when they came to take Christ. When we go to John and you go to John chapter 18, what's happening? It's when they came to take Christ. And do you notice that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the resurrection story is always in the last chapter. But don't you find it interesting that in John's gospel, the resurrection story is in chapter 20? Why? Because it's one Two and a half years is the representation. Christ was taken, crucified in the tomb and resurrected after about two and a half days. And the story and the type and shadow of the end of days is the two and a half days as two and a half years. That's the story. That's the revelation, brothers and sisters. Judas and this inerrancy, biblical inerrancy that they couldn't understand or or the that their their historical accuracy maybe just isn't that everything is true. No, it's that the understanding wasn't yet given. That's the answer. You know, we can prove this out even a little bit more. I think you guys know that. Those that have been watching for a little while. Remember Zechariah? We know Hosea is written to the Jew, uh, sorry, to the Gentile, and we know that Zechariah is written to Judah. We've talked about that many times. That's why in Zechariah 8, this is when they start rebuilding the city and the streets and the temple. This is why chapter 7, they said for seven years, you had observed, for 70 years, you, you did those 70 years, you observed the fifth and the seventh month. And the 70th year was over here. See, it's over during this point, and then it begins with what? Their second attack that removes them from the land for seven years. They have to be removed from the land for seven years because they've been disobedient in their Shemitah years, in their Sabbath years. God cannot build on the land of Jerusalem because the ground is defiled. It has to rest for seven years. And that's why Zechariah 7 said that, because it's seven years later. That's why Zechariah 8 
says now they're going to start rebuilding the city and the streets and the temple. And God is there on Mount Zion overseeing it all. That's why you see it's three and a half years of rebuilding. And that would mean what? We should be able to go to chapter 11 and see this connection to chapter 18 and find the connection to Matthew for the time of Judah being the one who causes Christ to be taken with two and a half years to go, receiving 30 pieces of silver. How about we have a look at that? Those that have been around for a little while, you know where I'm going with it. You've all seen it. This is Satan being cast down. Okay? This is the story of Satan right here. How will you fir trees for the cedar is fallen because the mighty are spoiled? How will, how will you oaks of Bashan for the forest of the vintage is come down? Okay? Now get ready. This is going to be a terrifying time. And what, is, what does he tell us here in Zechariah? That three shepherds also I cut off in one time. Uh, and I will not feed those that die, let them die. Those that are cut off, let them be cut off. And let the rest eat everyone the flesh of another. This doesn't sound like a time when Christ is going to be here and the city and the streets are being rebuilt, right? That's because it started here. One, two, three, and halfway through this year, this chapter 11, is when Satan's cast down. And so what does Jesus do? This is what we're being told, right? This is all prophecy. For uh, uh, And I took my staff, even beauty, and cut it asunder, that I might break my covenant, which I had made with all people, and it was broken in that day. Why did the Lord break his covenant? Because Satan's been cast down. He has to break his covenant. He's about to be cut off. This is exactly the story that's taking place about him being cut off. So now let's see, let's, let's confirm this. And so the poor of the flock that waited upon me knew that it was the word of the Lord. And I said unto them, if you think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. Hello? You see what's going on here? Everybody knows that the book of Zechariah, most people don't understand the whole book of Zechariah's prophecy, but many agree that the final seven, which is chapter 8 to 14, they understand as being prophetic. They think it only applies, to, uh, many think it only applies to prophetic that already was and fail to understand that, no, it's also a prophetic to what's to come. Well, who was given 30 pieces of silver to do what? You see, it's almost like the gospel of Matthew hasn't actually happened yet. Now, it has. I get it. We understand that, that it's happened. But... When you have these end time eyes and you understand these things, I'll tell you what, there is so much packed into it that you just say, well, there's no way that happened yet. There's no way that happened. There's no way that happened. Wait a second. That story couldn't have been twice. It's got to be something else. Okay. And, and just like we did with uh, the story of Jonah and Luke, Mark, and Matthew, you know, Mark, he said nothing and he left. But in, in Luke, it was 40 days. Everybody thinks that meant Jesus's resurrection. No. It hasn't happened yet, but they think it has, but it wasn't. It was prophetic because he said he would do as Jonah did. At Christ's resurrection for 40 days, he didn't do as Jonah did. And in Matthew, it says that it was three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Jesus wasn't three days and three nights in the belly of the earth at his death and resurrection. From his crucifixion to his resurrection was only about two and a half days of which only a day and a half was in the grave. So it was prophetic. It hasn't happened yet. But you see, in these, in these discrepancies, the church tried to, to make something fit because they know that, okay, it was about three days he died. It was about, uh, it was 40 days when he resurrected. So one is that, one is here. But then they're still left with Mark in the middle. Why was Mark not given anything? 
because the prophecy, the prophetic portion of it was that Mark would not receive a sign. And at the end of seals, at the end of six years of seals, into that seventh year uh, uh, Sabbath, in the time that they're going to be raptured, they're not going to know when the rapture is going to happen. That's why. The other two, there's 40 days after, there's, there's three days and three nights. They're prophetic signs. Listen, let's continue here in Zechariah eleven thirteen, And the Lord said unto me, cast it unto the potter a goodly price that I was praised at of them. Did you hear that? The Lord said unto me, oh, I think, Tabitha, you might like this one. Listen to that wording. And the Lord, Father God, said, cast, uh, said unto me, cast it unto the potter a goodly price that I was prized of, that I, I'm just highlighting this from my own memories, that I was prized of, hear that, hear that, of them. The Lord God Father said that I was prized at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. Meaning what? It must have been built. Well, of course it was built. It began back in chapter 8, three and a half years earlier. It's all there, guys. It's all there. And then you get the woe to the idol shepherd. Why do you get the woe? Because it's the time of the first woe. All right, the fifth trumpet, the first woe. This is the revelation of why he, in Matthew chapter 27, hung himself. Why Judas hung himself. It is not a discrepancy. It's a revelation that had not yet been revealed. It was understanding that just as Daniel 12, as Daniel was told in chapter 12, verse 4, Daniel, I know you don't understand these things. You've understood these other things, right? And then Daniel, right towards the end of 12, I, I don't understand what all this is about. And he says, don't worry, Daniel. These things aren't for you to understand. You'll be resurrected at the end in the last day. You'll stand up in your plot. Okay, but these were reserved for a time of the end when the books would open. You see, Zechariah 11, John 18, Matthew, Judas betrayal, the bull as the red heifer that has to be the atonement for the Jews that has to be three to four years old. How about three and a half exactly? And he becomes what? The atonement. Well, did you see that? It's in what? John chapter 18. Let's. Oh, I think we covered that in, in the last video, didn't we? But we never covered John. We covered other things about 18. You remember that? This is the 18th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. You guys remember? The reason why it's 22 letters long. Do you remember the 18th letter is Sade? Remember what this 18th letter, you see here it is right here? 18th letter, Sade. Look at what it means. Look at one of the understandings of it. The bent form of Sade represents righteous humility, but also is a picture of the suffering Sadiq, which is also... A picture of the Lord Yeshua suffering atones for sins. Suffering atonements for sins. What number is it? It's number 18. Where was this in John? How many times do we got to do this, guys? 
over and over and over. It keeps revealing itself exactly where it should. I just gave you four in one picture of Judas. That Judas type in shadow is going to be a Judas of a literal in the end in this time right here. Remember that, guys? Remember when we shared this in uh, in the last one with Leviticus chapter 1? Okay, or a couple videos back. See? At Christ's birth, it was the two turtle doves. At Christ's death and resurrection, he was the sheep, the male without blemish. This was for the world. Okay? When we say the world, you got to understand sometimes in Scripture, when it says for the world... It means Israel. It Don't think of the land of Israel. It means historic Israel. The 10 tribes that separated from Judah. Okay, Judah was to the south. Israel, Samaria was to the north. And those 10 scattered throughout the earth eventually, marrying Gentiles and all sorts of things. They became the world. They're represented as the, the church, the sleeping church, Israel, the world. Okay? This is who Christ died for, for those 10 of which he had to include the Gentiles, which is everybody on earth that, that came to him because they were mixed together. So this sacrifice for us is already done. That's why when the time of the Gentiles comes to an end, it will be when the Lord has returned on Mount Zion at the end of seals and the rapture of the church comes in, of that great multitude, not the bride of Christ that was in the beginning, but the great multitude. That will be the end of the Gentiles, the end of the world's time, the end of, is uh, of Israel's time. But guess what? That means while the Lord is here, there's one left. There's one more for the bull who is the son, the builder, and he's represented as the ox or the red heifer, who is in the beginning, which means Aleph, which means ox, going to be the atonement for who? For Judah. So what this is saying is that once this time is over and the time of the Gentiles has ended, it returns to the way it was. The Lord here, times will change, right? You gotta remember, there's still gonna be devastation of the first four trumpets falling on the earth while Jerusalem is surrounded and protected and things are being rebuilt. This is all in order, guys. This is fascinating. It's just, it's craziness how awesome it is. And see, don't forget, it also lines up with Daniel. For those that really want to understand Daniel, let me show you this as well. Let me go to this playlist real quick. This playlist, I saw it today as I was updating the, uh, the, the, the charts and so forth. After you've watched the, the, the first two and the third and then the pre-mid and post showing that they're all true, come and watch this one. This one's only 38 minutes and it's the revelation of Daniel 9. You are going to see it, but you must watch the other ones first. You're going to understand Daniel 9 isn't the story of, of, of just one set of seven. Let me rephrase that. <laughs> it is the story of one seven, but it's the second seven. And what's happened is the understanding of it was missed because they didn't count the weeks as years for the end. You see, when 70 weeks are accomplished, guess what? Now they're accomplished. It, they're, they're coming to that point of where the Lord's God's counting from. So what happens? 70 weeks as years. Going forth of the commandment to restore, that's because of the attack we told you about. That's going to happen, the escape of the bride. It'll be the first attack. Then at the end of 50 days, the Holy Ghost is going to anoint the group that's going to work seals. And it will be the second attack that will then have them removed from Jerusalem, as I showed you, remember? It'll have them removed from Jerusalem for the next seven years. It'll be vacant because the land is defiled. 
Well, here's what was missed. There's going to be a commandment to restore it after that first attack, but at the declaration to restore, the second attack by Ishmael is going to come. Okay, by by Syria is going to come. And look at what happens. For seven weeks, as years, it's not going to get rebuilt. So, yes, this is only talking about a seven-year portion for the rest of it, but what's been missed this entire time by scholars and everybody else is that this is the first seven, and it's not talked about because it's to the Gentiles, it's to Israel, it's to the world, and during that time, nothing is going to get rebuilt. They're not going to be rebuilding the city and the streets. It's not until the second half, after the seven weeks as years, that for the next three and a half, the city and the streets and the walls are going to be built, even in troublous times. Who are they going to build it to? Messiah, the prince. The anointed Messiah, the Lord, who will have come down at the end of seals on heavenly Mount Zion. This is the three and a half years where they're rebuilding. And when those three and a half years are done and the Lord was here, see, it says Messiah with a capital M is going to be cut off. So what do you have? Seven, three and a half. That's ten and a half years or halfway through the 11th year is the cutoff. See? It's everywhere. We only needed the keys to begin to understand these things. It's revealed from the, from the letters. It's revealed from Genesis 1 into Genesis 2. It's revealed in Genesis 7 to Genesis 8. You see, for those that are new, did you notice it's even in the story of Genesis itself from chapter 21, uh, sorry, from chapter 1 to chapter 21, just as it is in John's 21 chapters. John says, in the beginning. Genesis says, in the beginning. What happens in chapter, at the chapter 7, as the flood's about to begin? Noah and his family are in the ark. And when the 40 days are over, what happens? Chapter 8 is like the tribulation beginning. The 40 days have ended. Then you see Melchizedek, right? The, the, the priest, which Jesus is the type of Melchizedek when he comes as the high priest. <laughs> it's all there. You see in chapter 21, it says uh, Ishmael, who was born at the beginning Ishmael is now 14 years old and Abraham's 100. Abraham, when it started, Abraham was 86. So what is it? 14 years later, Isaac, uh, uh, Isaac is born, the promise, who's the type of Jesus as well. It's all there over and over and over again. Let's keep going. Watch this. You guys will remember this. We did this video called the whole wedding story. We have another video that's called uh, Everyone Loves a Weddings. It's a wedding and then in brackets is the word S. And that's because there are two wives. There are two brides. Okay? It's just like Jacob with Leah and Rachel. In fact, you end up hearing that uh, uh, in um, Pearl's video you see that she reveals something in relation to there being two wives. And it's the, it's the wording that equaled that there were two wives, two brides. Now, I don't know how much Pearl has watched Ministry Revealed over the years. I know she watched some, but I don't know if she fully understands the two wives, the two brides. The first bride is as Leah. That is the Gentile bride of Christ. That is the Gentile bride who's about to be taken out as I am speaking to you. We are a little bit over a month away. Okay? And then what happens? Well, that's the Leah type. There's still a Rachel to go. And what this pastor has never understood and what nobody had understood in the Revelation was that the story we read about in Matthew 25, 
about the foolish and wise virgins has absolutely nothing to do with the Gentile bride of Christ. Absolutely zip, zero, zilch, nada, nothing to do with us. It is all about Rachel. All right? That's what it's all about. And I've shared with this pastor, and I don't laugh because I'm laughing at the pastor. I love his excitement. Unfortunately, he's at the very end of the tribulation, and he's not talking about the Gentile bride. But do you know why? Yes, of course, you know, I say this all the time. The reason he doesn't know is because like everybody else that's been to to Bible school or everybody else that listens to the pastors that have taught them all these things, they all think and are all taught to think from a foundation of Matthew. That's the detriment. That is what is destroyed half over half of the understanding of the end of days. You see, but here's another thing. This is even crazier to see when you understand even a little bit that <laughs> why on earth, not only him, but everybody, Sandy and everybody else as well, that goes to the foolish and wise virgins and uses them as the bride what on earth are you talking about? They're bridesmaids. They're not brides. They're bridesmaids. And there's no such thing as a harvest story where in, uh, in the law that says you take half of the harvest and leave half of the harvest. You see, even in the understanding of Matthew 24, if your foundation and all you ever knew was everything was seven years based because all we know is Matthew. Well, then guess what? Look as you scroll down Matthew 24 in his discourse. This is all about the tribulation, right? This is your seven-year tribulation, false Christ, false prophets, you know, standing in the holy place, the abomination, great tribulation, all of this craziness going on. And then what? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, okay, the Son of Man, they'll see the sign of the Son of Man. All the tribes will mourn. Then as the branch is tender, and then what do you see? But of that day and hour knows no man, okay? No, not the angels in heaven, but my Father only. And then what does it say? But as the days of Noah were, so shall it also be at the coming of the, uh, the Son of Man shall be. At the coming of the Son of Man be. It goes on to explain, as it was in the days of Noah, all the craziness and the flood that took him away. And then it goes on to say, now you guys need to watch. You guys need to be paying attention. You need to be ready. Be wise servants. Okay, and I'll give you meat in due season when I come. Okay, don't think that I'm delaying. Right? Don't start thinking evil thoughts and thinking that I'm delaying and you're going to go beat the servants and smite the servants and do those things. Because when I return, I'm going to smite you and throw you out with the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, let me ask you something, brothers and sisters. Do you see any black letter words to separate any of this? Or is this what Christ was talking the whole way through? This is Christ telling them the story the whole way through, right? Here it is in the seven-year tribulation. There's your start of tribulation. There's your mid-trumpets mid or your mid-seven years, the abomination. There's more tribulation. There's Christ coming. And then he says when he comes, hey, nobody's going to know the day or hour. It's going to be as it was in the days of Noah. But I'm going to be gone for a little bit. And when I return, don't think I'm delayed and start smiting people or I'm going to throw you out to the feet gnashing of teeth and the weeping. All of this is still Christ speaking. So when you go to chapter 25, what makes anybody think this is before? 
Hello. Did you hear that? What is to make anybody think this is before the seven years tribulation when he's telling them the story from start to finish? Then he goes on to tell them about the foolish and the wise virgins. When the bridegroom cometh and they go out to meet him and then the door is shut. Do you understand what I just showed you? Even in people that want to think seven years only. I just showed you the seven years of tribulation. The Lord returning. It'll be like the days of Noah. And I'm going to be gone for a while. And when I return, you had better be watching and ready. Or I'm going to throw you out with the weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the foolish and wise virgins will be there. Some will be ready and some won't when I come in for the wedding ceremony. Did you hear that? <laughs> Did you hear that? That means that if you look at this whole thing, if you wanted to, a seven, well, let's just go to the final seven. That means that at the end of the seven years, there's going to be a period of time where he's gone after having come. And when he returns, after that one year, there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth for those who weren't watching, and they're going to be cast out. And the and the 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 foolish and the wise virgins are going to go run out to meet them, those who are ready. And those who aren't are also going to be left out because only those who were prepared are going to go in to the wedding with them. Do you understand what I just said? Let me share it with you now in the big picture. This story up to the end of the sixth trumpet is a story of 13 years. It turns out that women in history could be married, are, are married off at 13 years old. But they're married legally and their husband and wife, but there's one year in between the wedding or, or the, the, the official marriage to the time when he goes and prepares a place for her. And when he comes back, this is going to be exciting, guys. When he comes back, he's, remember? Do you remember what we shared in the previous video? Revelation chapter 21. Notice what I said, 21, the 21st year type and shadow. What do we know? It says that it's the bride who's already his wife. Because why? Well, because 13 years is how old she is when she can be married, which started at the beginning like Rachel Think of after Leah's taken, this is the time for Rachel, and what happens? 13 years, it be she becomes his wife. At the end, when he comes feet down on the Mount of Olives. But then what? Let's follow it in Matthew. Let's look at what Matthew says. The tribulation of the seven years has happened. On the, on the trumpets portion, as we know, this is Matthew, right? So now when it comes to an end, the Lord has come. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. And then what does he say? Nobody knows the day or hour. Only the father. And then he's, and we'll touch on this in a moment. And then he says what? He says, as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be at the coming of the son of man. Do you know how long the days of Noah were? Do you know that the story of Noah was his 600th year or like 6,000th year. And when the year was over, Noah was, where is it? 600th and first year, first month, first day of the month. 
the days of Noah were one year long after the 13 years. Or, you know, what, what they teach is thinking seven years. And this is why what's so awesome in this video is the guy literally goes on to talk about how the women are married at, the, the girls are married at 13 years old. That's what happened to Mary. Mary was married at 13 years old and she had she was pregnant with Jesus in that seven uh, uh, in that 14th year. He literally talks about it. So do you see how this this gets really convoluted that people would be so excited to be part of the foolish and wise virgins and being the the wise virgins not even understanding that the story they're reading is telling them that the foolish and wise virgins are about when he returns for his bride who is all done up, which happens after the marriage. It's the big ceremony one year later. That's why Matthew said they're thrown out with weeping and gnashing of teeth. He said it'll be like one year, it'll be like Noah's time. And when I return, if you're not watching and ready, you're going to be cast out with weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, weeping and gnashing of teeth, when do you think that is? The beginning of tribulation? No, it's the end of tribulation. The tribulation isn't weeping and gnashing of teeth. The end of tribulation, being cast out forever, is the weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the actual story itself is telling you, then shall, meaning then comes after this because it's all the Lord continuing telling the story. Now, what about the day and hour that nobody knows except the Father? Let's have a listen to, to a little bit that I clipped for you guys. Listen to this. Oh, too fast. <laughs> okay, give me a second here. Listen to what he talks about. The son works on the house, he gets it all done. The bride works on her gown, she gets it all done. The son goes to the father. It's a year later. Oh, one more. Okay, hear that? It's a year later. We all know that story. He's taking chapter 25 and he's putting it at the beginning of the story. Thing during that betrothal period that year, that's when Mary got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Whoa, what does that tell you? That means God's into controversy, and of course, Mary was in a very tight spot because she wore that veil, and rightfully so. And suddenly, she has to report, I'm pregnant. You see, that was a very, very difficult time for Mary and Joseph, and that meant that whatever their wedding ceremony was, it wasn't a big party, it probably ended up being an elopement at that point. Because even though there was no guilt and it was a holy thing, that the outsiders looking at this and family members were perplexed or ashamed, but it happened during that year period of time. So the bridegroom gets done. It's a year later. The wedding ceremony is going to take place. He calls his father and he says, Dad, I'm done. And he has to go through the formalities of having the, daughter, the, the father ex, uh, inspect the, the meal. He has to inspect the bridal chamber and the room where they're going to live. And when it's done, the father says, well done, son. We're ready to go. And the son says, great. I want to get my bride. He's got his, his brothers and his friends living with him. The bride has got her, her sisters and her girlfriends staying with her. They're getting ready to put the wedding together. This is how it's going to be. Everybody's posed for the picture, so to speak. And the father says, right, son, I'll tell you when. What? Yeah. This is the one thing that made a Galilean wedding a Galilean wedding. Because unlike every other wedding in the region, you always planned on when the bridegroom came to get the bride. The Galileans, being the rebels that they were, added one ingredient to their ceremony. It was a surprise wedding. You ladies are horrified hearing that, I'm sure. The guys are going, I wouldn't want that. <laughs> but that's the way they played the game. They knew about when it was going to take place because people would talk about it. There would be certain signs that would indicate that the bridegroom will be coming to get the bride soon, and they would drop hints all over the place, but nobody knew when it was going to happen except one man, the Father. No one knows the day or the hour of the coming of the Son of Man, not the angels of heaven, not even the Son, only the Father knows. When Jesus said those words, he wasn't making just a random statement about his second coming. Remember, these are people who don't abstract well. He was equating it to what they knew and some of them had already experienced, a Galilean wedding. It's gonna be like a wedding when I come back. 
and it's going to be a surprise. Nobody knows, only my father knows. So do you see that? Do you know what that means, brothers and sisters? Do you know that the day, you guys can all go watch this for yourselves. Watch the whole thing. You'll hear him say that they'd be married at 13. You heard him say that there's one more year. He unknowingly is saying that it's 13 years. Then they get married at, when she's 13. Then Mary got pregnant in that year. And then only the father knows the day and hour when he could tell the son, go get your bride. Well, when is he telling them? He's telling them after the one year is come to an end. And what does he say? It's the day and hour that nobody but the father knows. But it's only, you can go listen to it, like I said, it's only a one to two day period. Meaning the son's not going to have to wait a month or weeks or whatever. It's only going to be one to two days that that this that the father is then going to say, all right, go ahead and go get her. Do you know what that day is, brothers and sisters? The Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets is a one to two day time because this is the only feast that the Lord, uh, uh, sorry, it's the only feast that is declared with the crescent of the moon for the sounding of the shofar. They don't know if they're going to see the crescent. It might be cloudy or something, and they don't know if they're going to see the crescent on the first day. So it's given a two-day chance. If it's not seen on the first day, then it's automatically observed on the second day. You follow that? It is called the day and hour that no one knows, except the Father, of course. Did you hear what I was getting at? Did you figure it out yet? If or when the escape of the bride happens on July 17th, the 8th of Av, and the 50 days begin with the first attack on Israel, and 50 days later is the year's end, when the Holy Ghost comes and anoints for the tribulation to begin, and then the attack happens, the second attack, which happens at the year's end, and it happens on Tishri because it's the fast of the third month that would not be observed again, the tribulation of the 14 years begins at the Feast of Trumpets. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And when did he say that when that final year is over and the place that he went and to, to prepare for that final year while the bride was getting ready with her bridesmaids and they were preparing things for that whole year, the father comes and tells them within that one to two day period, son, go get her. And then the son blasts the shofar, which is the Feast of Trumpets. Meaning what? Meaning if the end of the 14 years is the Feast of Trumpets, what's the beginning of the 14 years? Hello. Hello. See how awesome that is? Let me let me finish with a, a few more minutes of listening to him, and then we'll be good. Okay? Listen to this. Got the robes ready. The bridegroom, he's sleeping with the guys in the room. They're all packed into one little room. The girls with all packed into one little room. She's got her wedding dress on. They got their white robes on. She doesn't have her veil on. They're going to put that on before she steps outside, and they have one lamp burning. And then, and this goes on for maybe a day or two. It doesn't last too long. They just don't know when it's going to happen. And See that? It's been about a year. It, there's a, a day or two. They don't know exactly when. That's because it's the Feast of Trumpets, and this guy knows it too. But that means if the end is the Feast of Trumpets, then so is the 14 years that started it all. In the middle of the night, typically, with the father holding an oil lamp, he comes into the room, and he steps over all those guys, and he comes over to his son, and he grabs his son. Son! 
What? Wake up. Why? Son? What, Dad? Go get your bride. Boing! He leaps to his feet. He starts making all the noise he can. He reaches for a ram's horn trumpet, a shofar, and he lets go a blast on that thing as loud as he can make it. This is the alarm clock for the whole village. Everybody wakes up because he's got to wake up the guests. They don't set the time on their iPhone for it to go off in the middle of the night. He's got to wake them up. So he lets go a blast on that thing. Everybody wakes up, and the whole village says, the wedding is on. The wedding is on. Those that aren't invited get to watch the parade when it comes by at night. In the meantime, all the boys get up, and man, they're excited too, and they start pounding pounding on walls and making all the noise they can. They pick up drums, they get khalils, which are these little whiny, little whiny uh, uh, flutes that they have in the Middle East. That, I don't know if you've ever heard one before, but it sounds like somebody strangling a cat. And they're playing this little thing, and boy, it makes all this noise. They blow the shofar some more, and the guys start dancing around the bridegroom and singing songs and making a big fuss, and he just absorbs it and takes it in. This is his moment. He gets to go get his bride, and they start shouting, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming. Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You see that? The bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming, was a midnight cry. They know they have to see the crescent of the moon when the father will know that moment to tell them to go. And then they charge out of the house carrying torches. Those that aren't carrying torches with noisemakers and drums and cymbals and khalils, shofars, whatever they can have. And two guys grab a litter, which is a chair between two poles or a platform between two poles. They're going to carry the bride on. And as they go, making all this noise, shouting, the bridegroom is coming, the bridegroom is coming, led by the bridegroom himself, they serpentine through the streets of the village. And as they do, people start rushing down off their rooftops. You know, it's hot back then. They sleep on the rooftops. They throw their robes on. They don't even have time to brush their teeth. It's gross. And they get down to the bottom. And they get in line with all of this noise. If they can get a torch, they light it. And they, the parade gets longer and longer and longer. And people are shouting and chanting and singing as it winds through the streets. It's an amazing thing. In the meantime, this has woken up the bride. All this fuss. And she's got just a few minutes to get herself in order. She stands up. All the bridesmaids dust all the stuff off of her because they've been sleeping on the floor or something like that. You know, so, so they got to get her all clean. They fix her makeup. She's heavily made up, even under her veil. So her eyes are all painted. Remember, they came out of Egypt. They knew these things. Her hands are painted with henna. You say, that's an Indian thing. No, it's a Middle Eastern thing. And they would get the henna from the, middle, from the Far East, but it would come on caravans. They would paint even the palms of her hand. And the reason why is that she's a bride. She's not supposed to do any work. Very interesting. And so they make sure everything's in order to make it perfect. They put the veil on her. They light all the oil lamps. And their lamps are in, the bowl, in bowls because they don't want the wind to blow them out if it's breezy that night. And the oil lamps can blow out pretty easy. I use them all the time in a presentation I do. And they're real easy to blow out. So they have the lamps in bowls. They step outside at night into the middle of the street. Now there are no street lamps. Can you imagine a row of women in a narrow village street dressed the way that I described, holding bowls of light right under their faces? I've seen it, and man, it knocks the wind out of you. It's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see. And there they stand in the streets with the bride leading the other women, waiting for the bridegroom to come around that corner, and they can hear the noise, and it's coming like traffic down the road. And finally they round the corner, and there's the bride. And I don't know about you, but I just would have stopped in my tracks and my jaw would have dropped, dropped. But we don't know, it's hypothetical, and they would have kept coming, and the bride uh, begins to approach the bridegroom. They're not allowed to touch, and then these guys burst through carrying that litter. They lay the litter down on the ground. She goes and sits down on the litter. If it's a platform, she would sit cross-legged under her dress because that was proper to do. And then these guys hoist her. Now listen to me. The bridegroom has come for the bride when she didn't expect it. It's a surprise. She sits down on that litter when he comes for her. They pick her up off the ground, and now in a beeline, they fly her to the father's house where everybody goes inside the compound in that parade. The gate is locked, and nobody goes out, and nobody comes in for seven days. Hello. Do you know why seven days? <clears throat> because it is the time of the wedding for the second bride. Remember that? The story as I finish up and wind it all down. Do you remember what happened with Jacob, with Leah and Rachel? Right? He says, yeah, I'm going to work seven years. He's all excited. He works those seven years. He gets Leah. He feels he was duped, right? And then he said, he's told to fulfill right? Uh, 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 what does it say? Fulfill her week because this was Leah's wedding week with Jacob. It's a seven-day feast at the end with the wedding. But what ended up happening at the end of that week? He got Rachel. But you never read a story about Rachel, uh, the wedding about Rachel. So what ended up happening? This is the Holy Spirit working 
for these seven years to bring in the Gentile bride of Christ, the Laetite. This is the Luke group, the, the, the dressed in beautiful, gorgeous white. And there's a seven-day wedding. That's why the Lord won't return to start his 40 days until after those seven days of the wedding, which is why he doesn't come till about an eight days later. And then the 40 days will start during this 50 that will begin after the escape of the bride, of the Gentile bride. But then what happens? Then you've got 13 years seven of seals, six of trumpets. At the end of these 13, the Lord returns. She's now of age, you could say. She's 13 years old. They, there's going to be that, that wedding that takes place. That's the end of, of, that, of, the, of the Mark 24 time. And what's going to happen? Uh, sorry, Matthew 24 time. What's going to happen? They're the bride, the bridemaids are, are with her. They've got their lambs, they're trimmed. They're doing all these things for one year. Okay, they're in a place protected. While what? While the final year, which is the earth being prepared to bring her back to it. This, this one year that's going to be as it was in the days of Noah. When that one year is done, when the Lord has destroyed all who came against Jerusalem and there were watchmen that are watching over the bride, that are watching over these things and taking care of things. When that one year is over and you follow the end of Matthew 24, you see that when the Lord is now coming, that final year is done. That 14th year is coming to an end. He says those that when he's coming at that time, if they weren't watching, if they weren't ready. It, they will be cast out with weeping and gnashing of teeth, just like the sleeping bridesmaids were. They were not prepared when at the end of that year, the shofar is blown at the time of the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows but the Father. And it's only a one to two day period at the end of that final year, which is the end of the 14th year when it will all be over, and then they have their one-week wedding, and all those not included are outside with the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Brothers and sisters, the revelations the Lord has given us through the power of His Holy Spirit is just mind-blowing. It is absolutely incredible. I don't even I don't even have words to properly give the understanding of all that we've been given. It's just, it's wild. It's wild. And it continues to come and it continues to come and it continues to come. This was that wow I was telling you about that when we would see it, we would say, oh my goodness, we've known of this video for how long? I, I've done this video back in July 2020, and we understood it even longer than that. That it's the Lord at the end of the 13 wedding, one year fixing things up, doing the cleanup, and then the shofar at the end of 14. So that if it's the shofar of the Feast of Trumpets blast for the Feast of Trumpets day and hour, no one knows, that if it ends with 14 and the 14th year, then it must begin the 14th year. And lo and behold, that is 100% what 2021 equals from the revelation the Lord gave us that it's all about the ox and the time of atonement for the end of days. I pray this blesses you, brothers and sisters. So exciting. I've got so many more things I want to share, very, very deep things that we'll get into as we continue to go forward as well. But I pray this blesses you. God bless you. God bless your family, your friends. Let's keep sharing and let's keep sharing this one, guys. Let them know this is it. We are here. Do it kindly. Do it respectfully. If they don't want to hear it, then just 
Let it be. Share it, share it with them once. And if they don't want to hear it, so be it. Because when these things begin to come to pass, they will remember. All right? They will remember, guys. And let's keep our eyes open because we're going to start seeing some things very soon. Here we are today, June 14th. We may see something here happen in Israel from the 26th to the 27th of June this year, this month. There may be some sort of attack. We may witness something, not something that's going to be completely devastating, but be prepared to see something. And let's remember, the bride may also experience something for a period of time. Whether it's that meteor coming that we were talking about that may be within this window or whether this is the time frame of Psalms 18 beginning before the escape. All right. We don't know exactly where Psalms 18 is going to play out. It may be a bit before the bride goes. We may see it coming and then the bride goes. But let's prepare our hearts and always be ready so that we also know. When we see these things begin to come to pass, we will know and be ready. I love you guys. God bless you. Bye for now.